Welcome to the Shasta College Preceptor Orientation Program, or How to Become a Gray Gorilla, a new view of the preceptor role. What is a preceptor? Preceptors are currently practicing staff nurses who have demonstrated knowledge and competent skills in the work setting and role model professional nursing to those who are learning to become a nurse. Preceptors are recommended by their managers to orient new staff or precept student nurses. To become a preceptor for student nurses, the California Board of Registered Nursing requires that nurses must be working on the same unit for at least one year and have formal training as both a coach and a mentor to nursing students. This video is part of that training. We selected the gray gorilla because it is the strongest animal in the jungle. It has no enemy save man, and yet this strong and fierce animal cares for its young in a very loving way. Not only does it care for its own babies, but it cares for all the babies that are part of that gorilla's family. And we see all the nurses in Shasta College as part of an extended family, and it's our job to help care for those novice nurses that are up and coming they're like our little baby nurses. The preceptor acts as the gray gorilla by teaching and advising, so the novice gains knowledge and assessment skills. By modeling behaviors, the novice gains technical expertise and professional values. By protecting and supporting, so that the novice gains problem solving and decision making skills. And by facilitating and counseling, so that the novice gains communication and collaboration skills. The result of working with a gray gorilla means that the novice emerges as a confident and skilled practitioner. Without a gray gorilla, the novice may feel fear, stress, anxiety, and may be easily frustrated and discouraged. Here are listed the course objectives, which will describe your role as a preceptor, some of the California BRN requirements, learning about various learning styles, the generational differences, strategies to support the preceptee, reality shock, evaluation information, strategies and techniques for providing feedback. All these things we'll cover in this course. The preceptor has three primary roles. They're, they function as a staff nurse role model, showing the nurse preceptee how they should behave once they are a staff nurse. The second role is to socialize to help the orientee or student to be accepted by others in the workplace. And the third role of the preceptor is to function as an educator. This second role requires awareness of current changes in the demographics of the workforce. For the first time in history, we have anywhere from three to five generations of nurses can be found working side by side. These generations encompass the traditionalist, the baby boomer, Gen Xers, the millennial generation, and an as yet unnamed generation. For the first time in history, we are living and working with five generations. One question that came to mind as I researched this topic was, who decides when a generation begins or ends? I looked it up and found that generations are formed when there are spikes in the population. In 1945, with the end of World War II, there was a definite spike in the number of babies being born. Again, in 1960, we have that spike that formed Generation X. And once again in 1980, that was the beginning of the millennial generation. I wanted to spend a minute and talk a little bit about the generation of traditionalists. This group of folks not only raise many of those who are in the workforce today, but are the bulk of our patient population. Understanding how they think and feel will assist us to better understand our own generation. This group was born before 1942. They have lived through at least one world war and sometimes two. They saw the Great Depression and are convinced that it was the only depression, that what happened in 2008 was barely even a blip in the radar. They've watched technology evolve. 
For many of them, technology leaves them befuddled and confused. When you ask about their first car, they may tell you it was a Model A Ford, and there's a good chance that they grew up before indoor plumbing was considered a standard in every house. They're often called the backbone of the country, and they're very patriotic. They believe strongly in respect and hierarchy, and they want things done right. They're the glue that holds this nation together, the holy grail of the country, and they value what worked in the past. The baby boom generation is the, one of the largest and most influential generations ever born. They're the largest consumer group in the known world. These folks came along and basically changed history. They grew up in a relatively safe world where they, where they felt secure enough to challenge the status quo. Some folks assert that they killed Donna Reed, although those of you born before 1964 probably don't even know who Donna Reed was, and that they changed the way men and women viewed their roles in society and the family. Because they were the post-World War II generation, they grew up during a time period of intense change. People were moving from the country to cities and the ways of business were evolving. Television came along and with it a plethora of new ideas. These influences shaped a change that would mark the beginning of a new order to society. Boomers were highly influenced by suburbia, TV, Vietnam, Watergate, protests, human rights, drugs, sex, and rock and roll. Prior to this generation, women traditionally stayed home and raised families. Baby boom women went to work, developed careers, burned their bras as symbols of oppression, and demanded equality. As a result, this generation is highly competitive, used to sacrificing for success, and has reshaped the world with their ideas. They question everything, especially authority, and think nothing of doing research before they seek out health care. They want answers to their questions and understand the hierarchy of the workplace. They seek out stimulating careers and never hesitate to work overtime or extra hours. In fact, having been raised by traditionalist parents, many of this group began their work careers at a very young age and worked from teenagehood until the present. Work brings them many rewards. As youngsters, they received recognition and praise, which was a rarity, from their parents for a job well done. The word that best describes this generation is optimistic. Since many boomers waited to have children, they were pursuing their careers, they've been the most responsible in creating the millennial generation. Another spike happened in 1964, which brought about Generation X. This generation watched the baby boomers sacrifice for their careers by working overtime, moving to get a promotion, and disregarding the family in favor of their jobs. This resulted in changes to the traditional family, including the dissolution of that family with two parents and two kids. Parents thought nothing of moving across the country to further their careers, even when leaving behind grandparents or aunts and uncles. Living around the corner from family was no longer a priority and divorce became more acceptable. Now mom and dad were both working, which left the kids at home long after school. The TV became the babysitter and the latchkey kid was born. As a result, Gen Xers tend to be skeptical, highly individualized, and want a flexible life and career. Change has always been part of the package and they are never bothered by it. This was the first group to play video games such as Pac-Man and Pong, have a car phone, even though it was almost as big as a suitcase, and watch movies in the comfort of their own homes. They were highly influenced by the remote control and the birth of the internet. Because of this, they learned to expect immediate results. Gen Xers are adept, clever, and edgy, and they consider themselves techno-savvy, although the generations following them have put them to shame. They were the first generation to decide that work would not rule their lives. Their motto is, work to live, not live to work. Because upheaval and moving are part of their upbringing, They've promoted travel nursing and are the largest group of travelers because having a portable career is very important to them. They pursue balance in all that they do and this is a hallmark of their generation. 
The next generation begins in 1980 and goes to 2000. This is the generation of today and the future. This generation has many names and they have already begun to influence society in surprising ways. In fact, when asked what they wanted to be called, they are the ones who chose the name Millennials and it has stuck. This is the first generation to grow up with computerized everything. They don't understand the statement, don't be a broken record, because they never played records. They came from an era where the focus went back to the family. Some of you remember the sign saying, babies on board and have you hugged your child today? Moms were older, the average age of a mother for a millennial is 27, and dads were more involved. Children became the focus. Even Las Vegas and Club Med got into the act by adding a whole family component. Children were included in many activities once reserved only for adults. No longer did parents want to talk to their children in the hierarchical structure that was used by previous generations. Parents got down on their knees to be eye level with their children when speaking to them. By doing this, equality in all things was reinforced. The idea that children had value and should be voting members became accepted, and no one was left behind. Awards were provided for everything and anything. Participant ribbons became the norm. Scores were supposedly not kept during games, even though everyone was keeping score. Mr. Rogers, the cultural icon for this generation, reminded them that above all else, you're special. And guess what? They believed it. In previous generations, parents told their children, go out and play, be back when the street lights come on. Not so for the children of this generation. Parents recognized that the world was a dangerous place. Instant communication had let us know about kidnappings and killings. Boomer parents recognized and knew all the perils in the world and refused to put their children at risk. They promptly took charge and structured their children's lives. They made play dates, took them to karate, gymnastics, soccer, little league, dance, and music lessons of all sorts. Children of this generation had little free time and they became used to knowing their activity schedule and sticking to that schedule. Their time has been organized for them since they were small. They're used to parent involvement and according to a survey by Northwest Mutual Life Insurance, mom and dad were among the top named candidates when asked who the millennials admired. The baby boomers wanted a closer relationship with their children than they had experienced with their parents. Even when the millennials went off to college, mom and dad were still involved. According to some college experts, these ties that previously were severed are still intact and when the millennials need help, they never hesitate to call mom and dad. With the advent of cell phones, laptop computers, email, and instant messaging, this generation communicates completely differently than any other generation in history. They embraced MySpace, Facebook, IMing, text messaging, and a myriad of other electronic communication methods. For them, it is the standard to be connected 24-7. Their cell phones travel everywhere with them, and they have the expectation that when one is called, one answers the phone. This generation is more comfortable with communication through technology than communicating face-to-face. Millennials also think globally. This is the most traveled generation in history. Most of them have been outside the country or traveled extensively within its borders. They don't see race, religion, or color. They prove this by holding flagpole prayers where kids of every color and religion, including Christian, Jews, Muslims, and Buddhists, gather at their high school flag in the morning for a time of prayer. This prayer has been organized by the kids themselves. Along with this, they have a sense of community involvement. They're used to working on teams and have logged more community service hours by the time they graduate from high school than some adults have done in their lifetimes. In a Roper study done on millennials, they felt the major, major cause of problems in the U.S. was selfishness. Three important events influenced this generation. The bombing of the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City, the Columbine shootings, and of course, 9-11. This generation grew up knowing that the world wasn't a safe place. Because of these events, they have a renewed sense of patriotism and national pride. They're interested in our government and want their voice to be heard. This has become evident in the amount of young voters who have turned out for the presidential election in the year 2008. They respect and love older people and want a mutual relationship with people from every generation. 
Some things that are important to remember, provide opportunities that allow them to participate. Share your values as they relate to them. The journey for these kids is as important as the destination and inspire team concepts they're used to working that way. We have to at least mention the generation that's to come. The newest generation has yet to be named. In their lifetime, our country has had one financial problem after the next. We have also always been at war. Technology is simply a part of their lives and they can't imagine a world without it. So far, many names have been proposed, but none has come to the forefront. Some of those names that are suggested are Generation Z, Digital Natives, Gen We, Selfies, and iGen. This slide just shows the goals of the different generations. The theme of each generation is slightly different and reflects their personal experiences growing up. The traditionalists want to leave a lasting influence. The baby boomers desire to have an outstanding work experience. The Gen Xers want their freedom to roam from place to place, and the millennials are busy multitasking in their careers. They usually have more than one thing going at a time. What motivates each generation? This provides the basis for why people continue to pursue their chosen careers. For the boomers, they long for money, title, recognition. Guess who works in nursing administration? While the Gen Xer is looking for their freedom, three days a week is enough for me. The millennial generation wants work that has meaning and provides them with a sense of contribution to the world. Tapping into the positive aspects and helping to restructure deficits will benefit everyone in the workplace and create an environment where nurses can support and feel supported. Caring starts with each nurse and then fans out to the patients and other staff members. By learning about other generations, one can begin the process of caring about what's important to them and thereby helping to make the workplace supportive and receptive to every generation. So remember, when you're working with each generation, try to focus on the things that are meaningful to them, keeping in mind some of these core concepts. We know that one of the most important things that we can do is to rely on each other and tap into those positive attributes that each one of us brings to the workplace. As we begin learning how to teach other people in the workplace, it's an important thing to discuss learning styles. Although the research may not be conclusive about whether using specific learning styles to teach actually improves learning, most of us have a particular way that we prefer to learn. This preference may be visual, where we prefer to read the information first before we do it, or auditory, where we prefer to listen to someone explain a procedure before we proceed, or tactile or hands-on where we prefer to get in there and just do it. Sometimes it may be a combination of preferences depending on the situation. To be able to effectively teach others, it's essential that we first understand ourselves as learners. How do we prefer to learn? This is important to understand because we tend to teach the way we prefer to learn. Teaching using only our own preference may cause conflict and become an obstacle to learning. Consider the following situations. Just do it. Why is she so slow? Wait, I wish you'd talk me through it first. This is a classic example of a conflict between two different types of learners. The new grad complains her preceptor expects her to just jump in and perform but doesn't feel ready and wants the preceptor to talk her through it. The preceptor doesn't see why the person is hesitating and thinks that she's slow in making a judgment on her. Yay, let's do it! She is so cocky. I wish she'd review it again and watch me demonstrate it first. Here the preceptor complains that his orientee does not take the time to carefully read the procedure before performing. The orientee wants to jump right in. Here is another example of conflict. 
Blah, blah, blah. What does he want me to say? I've already read it. I'm not stupid. Here again, the learner complains that her preceptor just talks and talks, explaining everything, even after the student has read and reread the procedure. The, prece the preceptor continually asks questions, expecting the student to explain how to proceed. The problem is the student prefers visual learning and the preceptor prefers auditory learning. So at the beginning of the preceptorship, ask the learner how they best learn. To be an effective teacher, we may need to adapt to the style preferred by the learner. Patricia Benner, a nurse researcher, studied the development of the professional nurse. She concluded that nurses move through five stages throughout their career in a progression from novice to expert. Each of these stages has unique characteristics. Nursing students typically have the characteristics that range between the first two stages, the novice and the advanced beginner. For the first few semesters of a nursing program, the student generally demonstrates the characteristics of a novice. As the student moves closer to the end of the program, they may begin to demonstrate some of the characteristics of the advanced beginner. For the novice, instruction begins with the teacher breaking down the critical elements of a task within a context-free environment. This means the student learns the steps of procedures without having a real patient. This means the student learns in a simulation lab or in a skills lab, not in the hospital setting. They're in a very controlled environment. Rules are provided for determining actions, just like a computer program. The novice acquires many rules for drawing conclusions and initiating interventions. You may hear them frequently make the following statements. I saw you do this, but the book says to do it this way. Or you may hear, my instructor did not do it that way. Or you might hear, our teachers told us it had to be done this way. Theoretical knowledge is foremost in their thinking because they've not had any clinical experience. Yet it's not everything for them. Each student comes with their own life experiences where they can build clinical knowledge. Just as a novice driver can distinguish elephants from cars on the road, nursing students already have the ability to make certain assessments. For example, they can recognize respiratory distress when they see it, or extreme agitation in patients, or severe pain without knowing the rules for such things. This we refer to as having common sense. As the nursing student gains more clinical expertise, they may move from novice into the second developmental stage, the advanced beginner. The advanced beginner, in spite of more patient care experiences under their belt, remains bound to rules and driven by tasks. Like the novice, the rules are held near and dear. Clinical situations are viewed as black and white with no shades of gray. When situations require innovation or creativity, you may hear them say, but you said to always do it this way. Clinical is seen through a veil of norms and procedures. It appears as a perplexing mystery, a collection of problems and conditions for action. Complex clinical situations create anxiety for the advanced beginner. Tasks are central to the advanced beginner. Everything else, the patient's changing condition, family concerns, all form a backdrop. Advanced beginners have a limited capacity to see the patient as a person. Instead, patient situations are dominated by tasks to be accomplished and viewed as learning opportunities. The expert nurse views the physical assessment as the gathering of information which will be used to structure patient care. The advanced beginner views it as one more task to be accomplished. Once it's done, it's done. 
When other priorities interrupt, you may hear an advanced beginner say, wait, but I have to finish my assessment first. The advanced beginner's attention and energies are absorbed into the complex inventory of things to be done, all of which are priorities. The result is a temporary incapacitating anxiety and concern over their own competence. Anxiety remains a large part of the clinical experience of the advanced beginner, shifting from unfocused anxiety to more specific concerns about the patient's condition. They are torn between attending to immediate patient needs and getting work done on time. Advanced beginners depend on nursing theory and the principles of nursing practice. They are book smart. They trust that clinical situations have a certain order, just like the textbooks, an order that can be grasped if they recall the correct knowledge or procedure. They do not yet appreciate the often undetermined changing nature of clinical nursing practice that is not contained in unit protocols or books. For them, clinical is a puzzle to be solved if they can find the right answer. Advanced beginners also have an unquestioning trust in the competence of other healthcare providers. They are extraordinarily dependent upon the expertise of others and assume their more experienced colleagues do not make mistakes. For example, if there is an AccuCheck scheduled for 11 o'clock per the pharmacy's pre-printed medication administration record, this, the advanced beginner may perform that AccuCheck at 11 o'clock without question, despite the fact that lunch trays arrive at one o'clock. They may not critically think that the time needs to be changed to meet the unit, to meet the patient schedule and not the unit schedules. No. Preceptors can help the advanced beginner by fitting report the patient's chart and other data into a meaningful whole. Preceptors can provide a context for them, letting them know what is and is not expected in the clinical situation. This will not replace experience, but will allow them to begin to recognize patterns and put together a clinical picture. Preceptors should think out loud to role model critical thinking for the advanced beginner. In this way, the beginner can see that it's not magic but careful, thoughtful, evidence-based thinking that guides the nurse in decision-making. Preceptors can help beginners provide care other than by the book, teaching them to safely bend the rules with careful oversight while still adhering to hospital policy. This teaches beginners to deal with competing concerns and learn to attend to the highest priority. For example, inserting a Foley catheter in a patient's room is very different from doing it in a skills lab Experienced nurses adapt to the equipment on hand and the setting, but still adhere to asepsis and hospital policy. Expert nurses make these adaptations intuitively. It's essential to explain these adaptations to the beginner who probably has learned only one way under very controlled conditions. Also, it's important to clarify that it is not acceptable to bend rules that violate nursing scope of practice and or hospital policy. Novice and advanced beginner nurses may not understand the difference. Because of the individualized nature of nursing school, where students take exams on their own and they're graded independently, the advanced beginner may believe that they must know all the answers without asking for help. They may not recognize that there are other resources available on the clinical unit. The preceptor can help the beginner by pointing out formal resources, the charge nurse, the clinical specialist, the pharmacist, dietitian, and others who may be experts in what they do, like the RN who's really great at starting IVs. The advanced beginner also has many doubts about their own personal competence and how to present themselves in situations they may feel incompetent. They need structured and unstructured opportunities to explore what it means to be a nurse. And the preceptor can help them by providing encouragement and support at the bedside. Additionally, meeting with other beginners and discovering a common experience may limit their own self-blame, help them to, that, 
to realize that they're not alone, that everybody had to learn and are learning. Advanced beginners must be coached to deal with conflict that may be encountered when advocating for the good of the patient. Beginners benefit from preceptors who highlight clinical situations which require questioning. Preceptors must support the beginner's correct judgment when it conflicts with the physician assessment or plans. The preceptor must reinforce that there is a chain of command that can be accessed when encountering inaction, resistance, or disagreement from the physician. Additionally, preceptors can role model for the beginner, beginner how to formulate a report or proposal to the physician that's likely to be acted upon. To promote critical thinking, it's essential for beginners to work in environments where they feel safe to ask questions. They have many questions and often feel their role is not as important in decision making because they ask so many questions. It's important that the beginner's clinical inexperience and constant questions not be judged as a personal inadequacy. Instead, it should be recognized as an expected phase in the development of critical thinking. The preceptor must keep in mind that the most hazardous, envir hazardous environment to the patient is the environment which punishes mistakes and judgments and sets up barriers to asking questions. Hiding mistakes and gaps in knowledge limit opportunities for learning and ultimately puts patients at risk. Integration of the newcomer nurse into the community of nursing is key to knowledge development. In contrast to hazing rights that test the beginner's emotional and physical endurance, putting every aspect of their behavior up to scrutiny, the preceptor needs to encourage other professional nurses to support the new person on the unit and to invite them into the life of the unit so they can be an active participant. Reality shock. Over 30 years ago, Marlene Kramer, a nurse researcher, described a type of culture shock that occurs as new nurses enter the profession. She labeled it reality shock. Reality shock is the shock-like effect upon a new grad nurse when they find out that the work situation for which they prepared, finished school, gone through all these hoops, is not what they really wanted. It doesn't operate with the values and ideals they had anticipated. This reaction is caused by a discrepancy between the school culture, the one in which the nurse was educated, and the one that actually exists in the real work setting. Reality shock is described as four stages, the honeymoon, the shock of rejection, and recovery phase. The honeymoon phase, this is usually where the beginner, new grad, where they are, especially as they start a new job or a pre new preceptorship, they believe everything in the world is just like they imagined it would be. They're thrilled to have gotten a job in the career for which they've worked so long and so hard, or they're so happy to be in preceptorship away from the nursing instructors and away from the classroom. Everything is rosy. Sadly, this is the shortest phase of reality shock. It usually ends with orientation. The good news is at this stage, the new nurse has a high energy level and is enthusiastic. They're very open to learning and see the positive in everything. They focus on learning routines and new skills, and they want to learn everything at once. The bad news is that they can become quickly discouraged, especially as the learning curve appears longer than they first anticipated. This leads to the next stage, which is shock and rejection. This is how it's really done. But that's not how we learned it. This is the shock and rejection phase where the new grad or the advanced beginner re realizes that the work situation is no longer so ideal. There's a conflict between what was valued in school, holistic care, step-by-step -step approaches, a therapeutic relationship with patients, and what is the reality at work, fragmented care, multitasking, and bureaucratic mandates that require completing mountains of paperwork. They may be told to forget what they learned in school by seasoned nurses because it won't help here. 
As a result, the beginner may feel anger, moral outrage, frustration. Disappointment, confusion, and disillusionment occur with the realization that the values they learned are not valued in the work setting. Additionally, anger may be turned inward toward themselves as they realize they are not grasping information as fast as they thought they would. The beginner may exhibit signs of excessive fatigue and negativity. They may feel incompetent, inadequate, and begin to burn out. Most worrisome is that they may also learn inappropriate workarounds and develop bad habits as they bend to peer pressure to adapt to the current environment. Preceptors can help them by listening and encouraging open communication, focusing on the positive, on the good things that they have accomplished, creating a climate of learning where less than perfect skills are acceptable, not abandoning them when they need support, and encourage them not to abandon their ideals and to write down their ideas about change. Role modeling as a proactive problem solver is what we want the person to become, not a complainer. Recovery. Here is where the new grad, the beginner, be learns to bend the rules and learns to laugh at themselves. Here is where the stress and anxiety decrease as work expectations are more easily met. The new grad begins to realize that more than one perspective exists. The recovery stage is marked by a return of the beginner's sense of humor. They can now laugh at themselves. Preceptors now can help them by nurturing this sense of humor, even in some stressful situations, and giving positive feedback about their pro progress. Also, sharing your own stories about your own mistakes may help them to feel like they're not alone. Biculturalism is the desired form of resolution to the differences between the values of the new beginner and the values of the workplace. This is where the new nurse keeps the best values and practices of both school and work cultures. And this is really the only way that things are able to change and improve because we always need new ideas from new people. Adult learners have different learning needs when compared to children. Becoming an effective preceptor involves understanding how adults learn best. Here are some tips. Adults are self-directed. The preceptors must actively involve them in the learning process and serve as a facilitator of learning, not a dictator. Adults have life experience. Preceptors need to connect the learning from previous experiences that the person has had, draw them out, ask them what have they seen, and recognize the value of what the learner brings to the table. Adults are goal-oriented. The preceptor really must encourage the learner to set reasonable goals and develop an organized education plan. Adults value what's relevant. Precept receptors can become more effective if they help the learner see the value of the orientation and how it applies to the profession. Minimizing or criticizing certain aspects of orientation may send the impression that it's not really important. Adults are practical. The preceptors must be clear and focused on the learning or the skills at hand. The learner may not be interested in knowledge for knowledge's sake. They want to know how it's going to be able to be used and how it's going to help them. And most importantly, adults deserve respect. And they demand respect. Effective preceptors acknowledge the experiences and the life skills the learner brings, recognizing that someone that everyone has something to offer. Belittling and criticizing or discouraging questions does not show respect and it stifles critical thinking. The nursing unit can be one of the most important tools in developing critical thinking. But in order for learning to occur, it must become a positive learning environment. Novices must be in an environment that encourages questioning. If nurses aren't taught to question, they are not being taught to think critically. Critical thinking requires an open and inquiring mind. 
facilitated by an attitude of doubt, which involves questioning. This questioning encourages us to reflect on our own practice to ensure that we're providing quality care and maintaining patient safety. Other things we can do to create a positive learning environment are create opportunities for learning, be proactive, don't assume learning will just happen. Focus on the positive, even if the only positive is that the person learns from a mistake that's made. Discuss your rationales for actions. Don't assume the learner knows why you do what you do. Share your thinking out loud. If a crisis occurs, after the dust settles, take the learner aside and discuss what happened in a non-judgmental manner. Let the learner express their concerns and feelings. Let them know that mistakes are the best teachers, but acknowledge that they may relive what happened over and over again. Don't allow the fear of making a mistake be an obstacle to their continued progress. Because we know mistakes are the best teachers. By working with the student, orientee, the new person on the job, it's important to set goals. For the Shasta College preceptors, setting goals for each week helps to increase the focus of the clinical experience for the student. A suggestion is to have the students choose one to three goals for the week. These must be attainable and realistic and should be reflective of where the student is in the precepting experience. Start out simply and have the goal become more complex as the preceptorship continues. The goals for the first week could be as simple as complete orientation to the unit, care successfully for, uh, for one to two patients, complete one successful IV insertion, Review the goals from the previous week to see if the goals were attained. If not, the goal may be carried forth to the next week. Often the student needs to focus on organizational skills and this carries on from week to week. Provide feedback to the student on their progress as this will assist them as they move through their preceptorship. So the goals should be described, should describe a specific end result. A goal should also make you stretch but be attainable. You should know why you're accomplishing the goal. And goals can change. What would you do in this situation? Trying to create a positive learning environment. A student, preceptee, approaches you, states his goal is to be organized and prepared for clinical. He tells you he's already drawn up the Lasix that has been ordered IV push. He's so proud that he's done this himself. He says, all I need is for you to watch me give this medication. Now, as a preceptor, you know that you must observe every step of preparing and administering IV push medications. What would you do now? Remember, you have to redirect your student but you also have to continue to create a positive learning environment. Think about it. Giving feedback. Feedback is never easy to give. And as a preceptor, you're required to do it with your person that you're orienting. What you're doing is not a formal feedback or formal evaluation like a manager would give to a staff person, yours is a peer performance evaluation. So you're giving feedback in a different type of way. This type of evaluation is participative and its goal is to increase the independence of the learner in their learning process. The effectiveness of a preceptor's evaluation during a preceptor experience depends upon the following characteristics. The preceptor must recognize the individual differences and competencies of each preceptee. It's not fair to compare them to others. The preceptor must plan specific patient assignments and learning activities that develop the identified learning gaps. The preceptor must gradually increase the workload and patient responsibilities and depending on the preceptor's progress. The preceptor must remain available and assist and evaluate their ability to care for the patients and make clinical judgments. 
Preceptor must meet with the preceptee throughout the shift to answer questions and assess their progress. And the preceptor must hold debriefing sessions at the end of the shift, noting progress or the need to improve. For evaluating the student, giving them feedback, be descriptive and specific. Say things like, I noticed. When this occurred, this happened. Give the facts. Focus on the behavior, not on an assumed attitude. Avoid giving advice. Nobody likes to give it to get it and they don't pay attention to it. Share timely information. Don't wait to give them feedback about something that needs to be corrected. Give it as soon as possible. Timing is everything. So when you have to give feedback that's not so positive, pick the right time and place. Not, it, the right time and place does not mean in front of everybody on a busy nursing unit. Allow time to digest. Allow the person time to process the feedback, especially if it's not so positive. And stand on your own when you're giving feedback. Say what you think or what you've observed, not what someone else told you. And above all, be sincere. People recognize sincerity. Remember the generations when giving feedback. Each of the generations expects feedback on the work they're doing, but generations want it to be in an, each in a different way. For those who are used to the traditional evaluation form, the once a year method is sufficient. The following generations have been raised in a world where feedback can be instantaneous. Gen X's don't want to be micromanaged, but they do want feedback on how it's working out. For the millennials, just text them or send them an email. They'll get it and respond instantly. Since this is a Shasta College preceptorship program and it's guided by the Board of Registered Nursing, it's good to review some of the requirements that they have. One of the points that we would like to make about having a student, a nursing student, Shasta College student as a preceptee is that they are not even at the level of a California interim permittee. And here are the guidelines that the Board of Registered Nursing has for the California interim permittees. Many nurses sometimes I think have forgotten what this actually says. A permittee is someone who's await waiting for their licensing, their, the results of their licensing exam, but they are still under the direct supervision of the RN. The RN must be present and available on that unit at all times. The interim permittee can only perform basic functions that were taught in the basic RN program. So if these limitations are for the, the interim permittee, the nursing student is even more limited. The nursing student is under the umbrella of Shasta College and must abide by the restrictions of the clinical rotation and the Shasta College Associate Degree Nursing Policies. Shasta College nursing students cannot act as an RN or as an interim permittee. They are limited in their scope of practice. If there are any questions about what a Shasta College RN student is able to do, the student or the preceptor must call the clinical instructor. The clinical instructors are available to answer questions. The students will be assigned to a specific instructor and they will know which instructor to contact about questions. The Shasta College ADN students have a list of do's and don'ts, but this list cannot include every situation. If there is a question or confusion about what a student can or cannot do, the student or the preceptor must call the assigned clinical instructor. For example, it's the policy of the Shasta College RN program that all IV push medication administrations must be observed by the clinical instructor or by the assigned preceptor during the preceptorship. Students must be observed while drawing up the IV push medications and during the administration of these meds. The Shasta College nursing student is limited in their practice 
by the skills they have practiced in the skills lab. The California Board of Registered Nursing stipulates that students must perform a skill in the skills lab before performing it in the clinical area. As a result of the limitations of the skills lab experiences, there are certain things the students have not been able to perform. The above list contains some of the items they may, that may not have been performed by the Shasta College RN student because they have not learned it in the skills lab. This list is not exhaustive. There may be other clinical skills that come up during the preceptorship that the student will not be able to perform. When in doubt, check with the instructor. Staying in touch with and notifying the instructor of important changes or issues is the student's responsibility. There are many things that may occur on the clinical unit that often require instructor notification. A few of those are listed here. If the student is floated, if they are canceled, if the they become, uh, preceptor becomes the charge nurse, you know, there was an accident or an incident, or if there's a conflict, the student must notify the instructor. The student is also responsible for the paperwork, for the evaluation forms, for the, the goal sheets, and for the time sheets. These are things that they will be asking you to fill out for them, but the preceptor is not responsible for that. Welcome to the Order of the Gray Gorilla. As Gray Gorillas, our objective during preceptorship is to prepare, educate, and support our future colleagues as we model exemplary care for our patients and their families. Congratulations, Congratulations on joining the Order of the Gray Gorilla. Please see the final slide for instructions on how to take the post test. It's really a survey on SurveyMonkey. There's a link there. You may be able to hyperlink it or you may have to cut and paste the link so that you can do that. Here's that final link that should help you so that you can take the final quiz and we can get you your CEU credits. Thank you for listening to this video presentation. Bye. Hey, did you see the monkeys moving? I sure did. <laughs>